Hello, everyone. Welcome to Zugehört, our podcast uh, on open education resources, actually in Germany or German-speaking countries. Today, though, we have an international guest from England. It's Josie Fraser. Hi, Josie. Great. You're taking your time to do a really recording of your talk. Actually, it's um, the second time that you're a guest on Zugehört because we had one live show as a hangout on air, but we had quite some, let's call it, I don't know, bandwidth issues uh, between England and Germany. So we're more than happy that you agreed to do a re-recording of your talk and to bring us some information on DigiLit Leicester. For everyone, uh, the few people out there that are not familiar with Josie Fraser, Josie is uh, working in Leicester on behalf of Leicester City Council. Uh, she's the ICT strategy lead on a project on which we will learn much more about in a few minutes from now. She's also a keynote speaker. I admired her talks, for example, uh, on OER 15, was it 15? 15, yes, in Cardiff uh, this year. And um, very much looking forward to hearing you talking about DigiLit Leicester right now. The stage is yours. I'm looking forward, and uh, maybe we'll have some questions af afterwards. But now I will be quiet for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Okay. Thank you very, very much for that lovely introduction, for the warm welcome, and for having me back again as well. I'm delighted to be here today. So I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing um, in Leicester, which for those of, who, of you who aren't familiar with, is a city in the middle of England. We're around the 10th largest authority. Uh, we're the second fastest growing city in the country. Um, and we're very um, diverse and we're very proud and um, celebratory of our diversity too. There's over 70 languages and dialects spoken within the city. I've been working for Leicester City Council um, in the capacity of ICT strategy lead. And what I've been doing is um, supporting the city in a huge investment uh, in schools and in technology in schools particularly. So we have 23 schools in our building program and it's been a 340 million pounds program. So significant rebuilding and refurbishment work has gone on over the last five years across the city. So last year, for example, I think we opened 11 schools. It's been awfully busy. As part of that work, to make sure that the city gets the absolute most it can out of the investment, I've been looking at school staff development in relation to the use of technology to support learners um, teaching and also to support the development of school communities. Um, and one of the ways that uh, I, I've kind of structured the work around this is to find out a bit more about actually what digital literacy teaching practices mean to secondary school staff. So the schools within my project are, are mainly secondary. And what that means is they support learners from the ages of 11 to 16. Some of our schools support learners up to the age of 18. And we also have a mix of mainstream large secondary schools and smaller specialist schools that support learners with a wide range of uh, physical and developmental uh, disabilities. And also young people with social, emotional and behavioral issues too. So um, an absolute pleasure to work with such a diverse range of professionals supporting around 20,000 young people right across the city. So in order to do this work, one of the things that we needed to know was what does digital literacy look like in the school sector at the moment? And what are the kind of strengths and gaps in practice that we have across the city at the moment? So in order to do this, I worked with Professor Richard Hall from De Montfort University, and we also had uh, Lucy Atkins, who is fantastic working for us on the DigiLit Leicester project, which was a partnership between the council, the university and the 23 schools in the project. And we worked together to create a framework of digital competencies that reflects school practice. So is 
um, captures the skills, practices, and knowledges that school staff need in order to uh, to in order to carry out really effective and really creative practice. And from this, we then went on to survey staff across the city, and we did that a couple of times. So we included in the actual survey. Um, I think there was about 730, over 730 staff members took time out to actually complete our survey to give us a really good picture of what staff uh, competencies looked like at individual level, at school level and at citywide level. And obviously, although Leicester is an amazing place that you should all come and visit as soon as you can, there's no reason really to think that staff in our city are not representative of the kinds of strengths gaps and practices of uh, staff supporting young people at that age over the UK and possibly um, broader as well. So it's unlikely that the results that we have from our survey are going to be drastically different than from other developed countries in terms of uh, confidences and competencies. So we um, surveyed around these six key areas. So I have to remember not to move my screen up and down. We surveyed around these six key areas, which were the strands that the school staff identified with us as being the important parts of digital literacy. One of the interesting things that came out was um, gaps in knowledge relating specifically to copyright. And I'm going to talk, talk about that a little bit more, but particularly those gaps um, featured in work relating to finding, evaluating and organising and creating and sharing. Now, these are two things that school staff do every single day. Um, it's very common for staff to find resources online, to look at whether they are going to best support their students, to modify those resources to support the specific needs of specific learners in their classes, also to create new resources and to share those resources with others as well. These are very, very common parts of teaching practice. But the scores in these two areas were far lower than we would have expected. And the reason for that was because of this kind of gap uh, around copyright that we identified. So what the survey uncovered were kind of key issues to do with school staff practice in relation to copyright. The first one of these is um, the feeling that staff have and the levels of confidence that staff have uh, about copyright. And I've characterised this here as on a spectrum of quiet anxiety to giddy exceptionalism. And by that, I mean, so quiet anxiety is staff members who are inhibited from using, sharing um, and making best um, using digital resources to their full extent because they're nervous that they don't properly understand the copyright restrictions and also rights that are attached to those resources. Giddy exceptionalism on the other hand is where staff members take the attitude that it's education so copyright doesn't actually come into it and I can do whatever I like. And while that's a very celebratory attitude towards using resources, um, it actually is not great in many ways. And some schools and some uh, staff members have got into trouble um, through using materials that they don't actually have rights to in ways that they don't have permission to be able to do so. And we want to avoid that. We want to keep everybody safe. Um, one of the things that we uncovered is that the majority of staff just haven't heard of open licensing, they haven't heard of open educational resources, and they haven't heard of Creative Commons, which, as, as people listening will know, is the most common uh, kind of open licensing uh, suite available internationally. And many staff were not aware of intellectual property issues in relation to their employment, and that's the key area that I'm going to come back to later on in the talk. What we did find, though, that was really, really positive and fantastic was a brilliant culture of sharing going on across the sector in the UK. And um, I'm hopeful that this is common to other areas, uh, to other countries as well. But there's a great culture of sharing. Staff do take, reuse, remix materials from, from each other and they 
um, share the materials that they have created. This is characterized though as being informal and un uncredited. And what I mean by that is that uh, there's no specific copyright information or permissions formally attached to the materials that they're working with. And very often there's no accreditation for who produced these materials, when the materials were produced, and what organization or institution that they've come from. And one of the things that um, I, I really believe is that this informality actually limits sharing. Um, because if you're a teacher and you've created a brilliant effective resource that draws upon other people's um, work, but you haven't credited it, and you're not quite sure where you may have got it from originally, and you haven't applied um, and you're not sure whether you actually have formal permission to be able to use it, then you're not going to be sharing it and promoting it and celebrating it in the same way as you would if you had the confidence about where those materials had come from. So in turn, you're not getting your name out there and you're not getting your school's name out there for other people to build on. But the good news is there is this culture of sharing and high quality and excellent resources are being produced and built on. So there's a huge amount to celebrate in the sector and to build upon already. So how we wanted to take uh, this, this really valuable resource forward was to create schools guidance and a suite of practical resources to help staff with, um, with open educational resources. Bearing in mind that we know that many, many staff have never heard of open educational resources. So uh, the key issue really, in order to enable them to benefit from open educational resources and to start looking at changing their practice to working more openly and to contributing to open educational resources that are available to others, was to introduce them to the ideas, uh, to the licenses and to the concepts around that. So we undertook a project and we worked with uh, Bjorn Hassler and Helen Neo from Cambridge University to create open educational resource guidance for schools, which is a suite of four documents that hopefully covers everything that you need to know as a teacher or as a member of school staff about open educational resources. If it doesn't cover everything, it's openly licensed. So please do take that work and add in the bits that we're missing. Um, obviously, we really, really welcome translations of the work and the African, Open Univers the African Virtual University have already begun doing some translations of the work for us as well and, and for other countries to benefit from. You can find all of these, um, all of our resources online at our school's extranet site. As I said, they're all openly licensed. They're also all produced in a couple of different formats too. So one that's easy to print, one that's far easier to take and remix as well. We've got some lovely um, graphic assets there as well that you are welcome to make use of. Um, we're really committed to public value and we're really committed to making as many people as possible benefit from the work that we're doing in Leicester. In January this year, we held the first, um, as far as I'm aware, the first European OER Schools Conference for school staff and practitioners. Uh, it's a brilliant event, really, really well attended, um, and we looked at four specific things within that uh, event. We looked at the basics of what OER is, um, what open practice is, what uh, different kinds of licenses were and what was available. We looked at policy issues, particularly for school leaders and decision makers in implementing um, policies that would support not just open educational practice, but also support schools in really looking at how they engage with and use and share digital resources. Because that's a kind of area that many, many schools have fallen into various practices, but not necessarily taken a strategic approach to reviewing and seeing how they can get the most out of that area. The other areas that we looked at were accessibility. Uh, we're very firmly committed to the idea that openness includes being as accessible as possible. Obviously, part of that is openly licensing materials so that people can uh, modify them to support learners' specific needs. But also, part of that is basic accessibility checks as well. And we did work around that at the conference.
And the other area we looked at was the new UK schools computing curriculum. Computing curriculum covers three key areas now in the UK. It's computer science, coding and programming and um, uh, digital literacy in terms mainly of e-safety. And what we looked at is how open educational resources and understanding open educational resources really map to those curriculum uh, the, the curriculum aims and can support learners both at secondary school and at primary school. And indeed, one of the attendees of the OER conference took some of our resources around finding um, items on Flickr and uh, created a suite of lessons for primary school age children that looked at how to find and um, reference open licenses, how to be respectful of people's online um, resources and how to find and share resources as well. So we were delighted with that. One of the other practical um, the other practical resources that we put out was uh, this guide to using Book Creator in Wikipedia that can be used by staff or students alike to create um, topic books on specific areas using text and image openly licensed from Wikipedia. Um, many of our staff never, never knew about this function before, they're very excited about it. Um, but please do go look at the school site because there's many resources on there that will be helpful and can be easily adapted to support you and your learners. Another key area um, that we looked at was the permission for staff to openly license their educational resources. And the reason that we did this is because we can't really say to staff, yes, please do um, use open educational resources, please do share open educational resources without actually underpinning that with the security that they won't get into trouble for sharing uh, their resources and also for us to be able to very clearly signal that we would like them to look at this as an area. So under um, intellectual property uh, rules and, uh, and the legal position in the UK, school employees, like other employees, um, unless there is a specific arrangement in your um, contract of work, the intellectual property rights belong by default to your employer. Now, many staff are not were not aware that that's the case because in the, the in the UK, it's not always explicitly written into school staff contracts. However, regardless of whether it's there or not, um, it, it it is the legal position at the moment. So what we've done by giving this permission is to basically take that part of the puzzle out of the equation. So if I want to openly license a resource and I'm working in one of the Leicester community schools, I don't have to find somebody in the council to ask whether that's okay or not. I have blanket permission and we've provided guidance for um, school leaders, for school governors, and also obviously for staff in how to approach that and um, how to take that forward. There's a huge amount of benefits for us as a local authority in giving this permission and in supporting this work. I'm going to I'll pick a couple out of this list, um, and I think this list itself is not exhaustive, but obviously from our point of view, um, staff work with and use digital resources every day. They are really, really important to um, teaching practice, to supporting learning, and also to letting the world know about schools and school organisations. So for, for me, understanding copyright and specifically understanding things in relation to open educational resources and practice are a really important key part of digital literacy and it shouldn't be left out of digital competency frameworks or, or kind of any other area for any educator at any level whether they're working in schools that, or, or they're working in the further adult education sector or universities it's a key part of, of education staff digital literacy. Um, I've I talked briefly before about ensuring public value. Obviously, we're a local authority. 
we are committed to making the money that we receive from the public purse go as far as, as absolutely possible. And this is a brilliant way to ensure that publicly funded works are publicly available and to promote and encourage that, that as, a, as a kind of a default model, which is where we would like to get to. Um, and also, I think, you know, our schools do some amazing work. They should be really, really proud of the level and quality of things that they're doing. And by openly licensing that work is a great way to connect to other schools and institutions, to support other staff members, and really importantly, to, to support learners, um, whichever, whatever kind of educational setting those learners might be in. And um, we have a lot of homeschool um, learners in the city who don't have access to the kinds of resources and benefits that young people in our schools have so there's 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 just one direct community that will benefit from this initiative we recommend uh, CC by 4.0 um, in line with the kind of very broad level European recommendations and also our own uh, national government recommendations to ensure that openly licensed work is licensed as openly and as flexibly as possible so that other people can do and what you can see there is a kind of a, a little, little example of um, how to uh, properly um, to how to properly uh, accredit work that we've we've just given to help staff and uh, teachers understand. Now, when I, I I usually show a slide of this kind of equivalent to groups of staff or governors or school leaders when I'm talking to them, and many of them have never seen this before. Many of them have seen this before but haven't noticed it. So, for example, they'll have watched TEDx videos, they'll have watched other openly licensed things, but they will have done so unconsciously and they won't be aware of what this means and and the benefits that this brings to them. So I always make sure that there's an example of a license and there's an example of uh, license accreditation in any kind of talk that I do. And it's really good to um, support people that are, that are right at the beginning of that journey, getting started with open practice and open educational resources to take those first steps. In terms of schools, these are the kind of key questions I would want our schools to be asking themselves and actually the kinds of questions that I would be wanting schools everywhere to be asking themselves. Do your staff know about open licensing? The answer is probably no. So, you know, how are you going to get started on that journey? We've created a lot of resources that can help you with that, but really um, it, it is something, especially within the context of digital literacy, that schools have to be thinking of and taking forward. Are all staff aware of um, the IP conditions of their employment? Which kind of licenses do the school prefer? I think that's a really interesting conversation and I've had many, many discussions with people about which is the best license, um, which license, which, you know, which license is, which licenses are not very good. I don't think, I don't believe it's a necessarily a one size fits all solution. I think potentially some licenses are better in some situations than others but I think the important thing is that we have those conversations we have those discussions and we think about why we would license under which conditions and what our rationale behind that is it's a really important conversation um, what resources could schools and staff be shown because every school will have amazing resources that they can already open license it's not a question of creating a load of new stuff so that you can engage in open practice it's really important to review what you already have and also how can staff be supported to share work openly because um, some staff will be very reticent to share their work for a wide range of reasons and we need to engage with those reasons and i'll finish there thank you very much for having me to come and talk to you about the work we've been doing Thank you very much, Josie Fraser. Uh, if you don't mind, I will bring in some questions I remember from the live recording last time and some of my own questions. Uh, you were talking about the school staff getting in trouble for using resources in a problematic way uh, in, in former OER times or not former, the pre OER times. Uh, is, 
and now you have uh, or the teachers have the support of their city council uh, to to openly license their own works. But is there also um, a discussion about the legal liabilities of um, publishing your own content? Uh, so does the city council or the school maybe uh, take over the the risk uh, for using problematic content in your new work now? So maybe you're not too sure about how to use um, open licenses and you publish something now because you're uh, you think, ah, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do, and I like to do this, but obviously you're doing something wrong in the first place. And uh, is this a, still a problem with the teacher, the individual teacher? Okay, so that's quite a complex question, um, and it does rely on, but I think what it does is it acknowledges that um, this isn't a no threshold area for staff to enter into and that they will have concerns and they will have um uh they will they will not necessarily be super confident at an individual level and at a school level in engaging with and producing um, open educational resources i think obviously first of all it is really really important to understand the basics and one of the things that we've been doing is trying to make that as easy as possible and as um as accessible as possible to staff who are new to this whole area. Um, in terms of getting into trouble for putting things out, obviously we do have staff that um, through these conversations have realised that they've been posting images, for example, that they don't have rights to on their blogs or they've been using materials in ways that they shouldn't they shouldn't have. And those staff are usually very upset when they realise that they, they can't do that. And the attitude that I have taken to that is that uh, this isn't about punishing people for things that they haven't necessarily known in the past or for um, you know have, holding people to account for think for genuine mistakes it's actually about saying okay this is an opportunity to look at my practice professionally and to you know start a new day in terms of my practice going forward unfortunately we have had schools um, in in the city but also you know nationwide that have incurred fines for using materials that they're not supposed to be using and we really do want to avoid that because we want all of our money to be going on learners not on copyright fines uh, you were talking about the, the brilliant culture of sharing uh, in schools and how does this um, can, can can this be transferred to the greater network or maybe even the public uh, network of sharing so that it's not only informal in my school but also sharing with the world wide web out there yeah and I think to some extent it already is so what you'll find I think is locally things like policies get shared around a lot more because there are strong networks in school leadership and school business managers who will connect to each other and, and do those things. Actually, one of the things that we all want to build is collaboration across schools within subject areas. And that's not just internationally, that is actually locally too, because collaboration even locally is very, very variable. But we do know that um, creating resources with a wider range of expertise, with a, a variety of people feeding into them, can make those resources much richer, much more effective, much more professional, and, and much better for learners in the long run. So really, the approach that we've taken here is underpinning that strategy to support that kind of collaboration, yes, internationally, but also locally. To, to try and strengthen and increase um, connections and sharing and development. We love to um, kind of move towards a situation where staff were collaboratively creating uh, textbooks, collaboratively creating other resources. And I think what the permission that we've provided gives is that platform underlying any kind of issues of ownership um, to be able to do that work and then to share it and pass that pass the results of that work on as well. Are there or were there any collaboration with publishers? 
no, <laughs> not in ours. But um, I mean, I have talked to um, various publishers about copyright, and obviously, one of their concerns um, is around staff understanding of copyright too. That they're, they're equally concerned that staff understand those. So in the UK, we have two key school licenses for materials. We have the ERA license, which covers um, film, um, music, things like that, and we have the CLA schools license which covers a lot of printed material and those licenses are um, provided to schools through central government funding and give schools a range of freedoms to do things with uh, the works that come under the terms of the license but they have the kind of same issue with um, staff not having the confidence to know what is licensed what isn't licensed what can be done with materials what can't be done with materials um, using moving towards OER is obviously a way of undercutting a lot of those issues because it's very clear on the material itself what you can and can't do. However, um, it's one step I think in a larger piece, and I think increasing copyright knowledge in general is is something that we need to do um, nationwide for the longer term as well because there are materials that are provided to schools that are not provided under open license that are very good um, but staff may not be using them as well because they're similarly not confident enough. Uh, maybe just one more thing about the, the, the educational level. Uh, you were talking about adapting school or adapting resources for, for students with special needs and that's a huge topic in Germany right now. So how does this contribute to OER, or otherwise uh, does this OER contribute to this question? Okay, it fundamentally contributes to it in terms of um, being able to, for, for specific practitioners, to be able to uh, customize and tailor materials for their learners. I think another issue is that there is generally uh, legal um, support for the customization of materials in relation to learners with specific disabilities but these rules don't necessarily extend to a whole class so if you're teaching in a whole class you don't necessarily want to differentiate materials for your disabled learners you may want to produce something that actually looks similar for all of your class and you can't currently do that with some with licensing restrictions which is a great shame because um, students with disabilities don't necessarily want to have different things in the classroom to the other learners and uh, learners without disabilities can very often benefit from the affordances of materials that support uh, disabled learners as well so it's, it's absolutely critical as, as far as I'm concerned obviously anybody who works in the area of disability knows that even within specific disabilities there is a huge spectrum of um, need of, of, of preference and of, um, of, of, of the different things that that specific makes difficult for that specific learners so, so the flexibility to actually be able to change things is, is absolutely critical to support all of our learners. In settings where, um, the, in, in non-mainstream settings where the majority of learners have disabilities, those are very, very diverse settings as well. They're, they're incredibly diverse. Uh, it, we, we work with uh, several schools that support a wide range of disabilities and different kinds of disabilities and um, you know all of those learners are very, very different in what they need and what they support. Uh, and they're very, very much more um, attuned to using digital resources as well in, in the uh, special education schools. It's very typical for learners to have their own devices that are customised for them with a range of different programmes, different, um, different tools to support their specific needs. It's very hard to scale those kinds of things. Being able to differentiate is really, really important to support those learners as much as possible. Uh, let's take a look into the future, or near future maybe. Uh, does Leicester somehow ensure the sustainability of your project? Or is there like, often is the end of funding and end of project uh, with this too? 
Okay, so one of the important things that we're doing is um, supporting peer-led work in this area and, and practitioner-led work in this area. And actually tomorrow, very excitingly, I've got the first meeting of um, city open educational uh, practitioner leads for schools. So we have 12 teachers in the first instance from a range of secondary and SEM schools and they've committed to working for the next year looking at supporting their schools and their school leadership in, um, in, in making sure that people uh, understand what OER is at a whole school level at supporting leaders in establishing policies and practices that help them with this and also they've committed to supporting primary schools as well and they'll be developing a network that will help help them help themselves and will take this project work forward so yes obviously with any project you it's always a concern that if a few key people stop doing that work will everything just vanish so this is the approach that we're taking to actually ensure sustainability we're giving it and putting it in the hands of um, teaching staff how did you find those 12 are those the the oer nerds or? no no they're, they're not no nerds at all we're very thin on the ground in OER nerds as in many places so a couple of the practitioners um are very interested in this area and actually helped us out on the development of the um, guidance because we did consultation with school staff to make sure that we were hitting the right kind of phrasing um, giving the right kinds of information so a couple we picked up from there and they have familiarity with what the work that we've been doing May, many <laughs> know very very little about open education but they are all committed to the kind of principles of making knowledge accessible to all and to supporting their learners and that is really driving um, their passion for taking part in this work and this network. It's a fantastic opportunity for them in terms of their own professional development and it's a great um, group to belong to. So I'm really excited to be introducing them all to each other tomorrow because I think they're going to get on very well with each other. Okay, all the best for tomorrow. One more question just for, for uh, tonight. Um, do you think this is a model that can be, be rolled out across schools across the country or maybe in Europe and in Germany? Yes, I do. But I think it needs to be rolled out in terms of digital competencies or digital literacy frameworks and work. Now, where we're going in terms of, um, where we're going definitely, well, I think internationally in terms of digital literacy is that there's an increasing recognition that we've missed a lot of tricks in terms of supporting school staff development in this area and also in terms of supporting staff in higher adult and further education so JISC for example is doing some amazing work in terms of their refreshed digital competencies framework uh, there's been recent announcements from the Welsh government uh, they're, be, they're taking a whole country approach to digital literacy and digital competencies and starting to do work. They've just done an incredible piece of work with the further education sector and they're looking at extending that to the school sector now as well. I think this is a very exciting time to be involved in open educational resources and excited and passionate about the benefits of open educational practice because um, digital literacy is a really important driver for supporting our learners, for developing our organisations and OER is a key part of digital literacy. So it's been exciting to talk to you again, so I had the pleasure to talk to you twice and uh, listen to your talk twice. Uh, all the best for your work in the near future and beyond this. And I um, hope to see you again on another con conference or maybe see you on the screen for another podcast. Uh, now, first of all, thanks again. Thanks also to Blanche Hartley, who has been our producer in the background. And bye-bye to everyone.